Hi, my name is Phil, and I'm going to be on the Online Prosperity Show, where I'll be talking about all things IT and how you can support your business's IT infrastructure. Now, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today, I've brought you Phil. Phil, who is a business IT support specialist. Phil, how are you today? Good, thanks. Fantastic. Now, Phil, thank you so much for taking your time with us today. We are so tired of being told to switch on and switch off our computer just to make sure that everything is running. And if you're watching this show right now, you would appreciate that your IT infrastructure is the lifeblood of your business. It actually keeps you operational, your team operational, and actually allows you to deliver the services and enables you to communicate and collaborate effectively. Now, if your um, IT is not working um, you know, in your favor, you might actually be wasting times of time you know trying to set up yourself in order to run your business so that it's profitable and enjoyable so i've brought to you uh phil from TechSeek, who has been providing it support services to small businesses since 2006 and they offer on-site support um to melbourne inner north and west as well as nationwide remote support they work with lawyers accountants dental clinics child care centers and allied health providers, including people in construction and trade companies. Now, Phil, I could go on and on talking about, um, you know, your business and everything else while you, the specialist, is here to tell us, um, um, you know, all about it. Tell us a little bit about how you got started and what it is that you actually do there, Phil. Yeah, cool. So I started obviously back in 2006. Initially, I was servicing both residential uh, and some small business owners. And I guess the residential, a lot of those residential customers had businesses. And so that's how I kind of branched into doing businesses. Um, and then as we started to get more and more business owners across, uh, I guess we got to the point where we had to start uh, offering more of a service that's between the hours of nine to five to sort of um, keep up with those demands during business hours um, and less of a kind of a 24 call when you need us sort of um, model. Uh, and so I got to a point eventually where I stopped providing remote support and on-site support for residential clients and focused more on uh, small businesses. The issue that I came across uh, a few years after that was that the types of technicians that I was replacing, I guess when I would walk into a new, um, a new business, I'd always ask sort of what the current issues were or pain points were with the existing technician. And I was starting to hear some patterns, primarily that, um, the tech was very good, but the serviceability was starting to fall. And that seems to be the case um, just due to the fact that a lot of these, uh, I guess, one man bands are chasing their tails, trying to make sure they can get enough uh, income in per week so that they can cover their overheads. So as a result, some of those customers that you've had for years and years, because they're not calling you every week and you, you don't expect them to because you're, you know, you're doing the right job and fixing everything up, you're taking on so many new clients that sometimes you can't get to those old clients. So the relationship starts to dwindle and break apart. And I kind of said, well, this is gonna keep, this is gonna happen to me at some point. I'm gonna start neglecting clients because by the time they actually need me, I'll be too busy to get out there. Um, the other issue was that, um, you know, how do I, if I put subcontractors on, are they gonna treat the customers with the same um, level of loyalty or trust or do things the same way or you know what are they going to do with passwords and company data can I, you know are they going to treat the business as their own and which in, in most cases they're not going to and so that's kind of one of the business models that's out there where it's kind of a, a break fix type model where I'm a company owner and I've got 500 subcontractors but I guess the problem with that was that you know, when you're when you're a company and you're allowing someone like that to come into your business and exposing them to your passwords and your company data, you don't know what they're actually, you know, whether there's a policy in place on how they keep their data, what they do with it. You also need to re-induct them every time a new person comes through. So that's again more, more of your billable time that you're, you know, it's it's unbillable time essentially that you're wasting trying to say, well, this is this is how our network works, this is our printer, these are the passwords, these are the settings. And then the same job as the other technician. 
Whereas what I was trying to do is go, well, I want to create some sort of a model whereby I can still service these clients regularly. Um, I can forecast, uh, I can forecast work, meaning that I can put full-time technicians on, but also that they're going to have access to the same technician. So, it, you know, same as your mechanic, same as your bookkeeper, you're not going to change your bookkeeper every time your bass is due, but these customs are doing that with technicians. They're switching and switching and switching. So, Whereas obviously the reason we, you know, we use the same bookkeeper is that they already know our books. They, they've already been um, inducted on how things work at our business. And if there's a problem or a discrepancy, they're very quick to fix it. And we're saying, well, we want to be in that same position where, you know, if there's a problem with a, with a, with a customer, we can fix it in a shorter amount of time because we know the customer because we've, you know, they're a client, they've been a client of ours for a long time. And they're not taking the risk of having a different tech um, I'm providing support to the other techs that are working with me and vice versa. So the level of competency is the same. So you're not taking a risk in terms of, is this person going to do as good a job? Is this person, what is this person going to do with my passwords? Uh, you know, am I giving my, you know, my IP to a different company, to a different tech company anymore? So we're kind of getting rid of all those issues. But in addition to that, we still wanted to look after small business owners. And so a lot of the only other real model besides this break fix model where you're made up of subcontractors is a man, you know, becoming a managed service provider where you're having to lock customers in say for 36 months and you're having to charge them you know, a per device fee and a um, you know, $1,000 or two to three or $4,000 contract depending on the size of the company. So a lot of our small business owners would always say, Yes, this would be great to have someone always come out and um, you know look after our IT. However, we're just not that big. We don't need someone every single month, but we want we'd love to have someone you know ongoing. So, so allowed the customer to sign up for as little as 160 a month, which meaning they could they could buy as little as an hour a month, depending on their size. Um, and in addition to that, because, uh, because of the way the model works, we allow those hours if they're unused to roll over. So for a customer that basically needs um, ongoing support and doesn't need you every month, that first two, three months, if they don't use us, that's okay. Because then say in two or three months time, they'll have two or three hours or four, depending on, um, banked up. And they can use it like an insurance policy, right? This month, I've got a new staff member starting or I've bought a new printer or I can't get my email. Those hours are banked up. And they're not having to basically worry about, well, what's this going to cost me now to get all this sorted? There's no dint in their cash flow because they've, they've, been, they've been getting direct debited for that amount, that one hour each month. And so it's, it's like a security or an insurance policy, I'd say. So Absolutely. it's become very popular in, 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 that, in that case. Absolutely. I mean, some of these things, you never know when your computer is going to break and you actually need somebody to fix it um, instantly. So how do you then prioritize people that are already part of your um you know part of your subscription and those that are just getting started with you who do you um jump out of bed for immediately we'll do a once-off job is if we meet a new potential client and we go into a like we, we offer free audits so we go out and have a chat and have their it needs and talk about there's a lot of, I guess, bill analysis we look at and have a look at what they're spending on various services and what their subscriptions are costing and all that sort of stuff. We initially start off with that, but they might say, look, do you know what, In, I guess to get a taste of our service, they might say, can you help us fix this sort of issue that's really becoming a bit of a headache because we haven't been able to get in touch with our technician and we're thinking of changing anyway, and they get to kind of trial the service. So for that sort of a person, we go out and do that job. After that, then we'd, we'd ask them to um, sign up for ongoing support on our membership. And again, the membership doesn't have a lock-in fee or things like that. But the one with the text section, and it gets logged in the other two things email as well. But the idea is that the text, because of that ticketing system, the text can basically quickly screen through and see what type of jobs are coming through and who's um, not so much more important, but which job needs to be done sooner because it's more urgent or, you know, who's going to be impacted more as a result of the current tickets that are in there. So we're constantly trying to triage um, the jobs, but at the same time, we're not to that point where 
a customer is going to wait four or five hours to see us because based on those memberships, we can see how many hours are being, um, how many hours of memberships we have or subscribers we have per month. So therefore, as we grow, we just put on another submission. Absolutely. So there's not that issue. Yeah, there's not that issue of, oh my God, we've got to get through all the tickets. There's so many tickets. The guys are constantly looking and I'm constantly looking to see um, how quickly we go through tickets. Um, and as a result, we can then forecast whether we're starting to sort of veer towards needing another person full-time or part-time to help with that flow. Absolutely. So when somebody is already subscribed and everything else is working, what should they be on the lookout for in order for them to call you just so they don't waste them, their call out, um, you know, hour with you? Because sometimes it might yeah. just be a, a, an issue that can be resolved remotely or something that you can just, uh, you know, talk to people on the phone. Yeah. So in terms of the remote support, we do it in 15 minute blocks. So, the, and because of the fact that you get the rolling hours, you're not, you don't have to use those hours up each month. So it means that what we try to say to people is if you've got a few little small issues, just if they can wait, give us a call and we can either do it remotely. But if you find you've got a few little small issues and you've got a few staff that have it, then book us out for an onsite visit. We'll come out and sort of smash through everything all, all at once. So, but I guess the, the other important things to do is, and I guess the things that we kind of try to, Re retrain people's tra like train of thought on is that, you know, we want to make sure that you know how to check whether your backups were successful, for example. We want to know that you know how to check whether, you know, antivirus is, is valid or has been updating and things like that so that you're not heavily reliant on us where you're kind of flying blind. So if a customer says, you know, I mean, for me, I would rather a customer call me and say, hey, I've checked my backups or I received a report or something of, of that nature but it's, it's coming up with an error or it's saying there's a problem, then we'll jump in and sort that out. But also it allows them to basically have more control and say, look, I, I know my backups are working. Rather than sort of going, I oh, will charge you this many hours to check your backup and this many hours to do that. If it's all working fine. I mean, one example was a client who was their current tech, the, the previous tech company was charging them every time they had to update a password on Office 365. Whereas, we could have just taught something like that in 20 minutes, half an hour, written some instructions for them and they could have done it themselves. So it's about, it's about that sort of stuff going, well, we, we want you to use your hours, but you need to, you know, we want to make sure that you're using that to stuff that's, you know, outside your scope of understanding. And, um, and, you know, and also, I mean, if, if you're that busy that, you know, we should be, we should be doing it for you. We want to be doing that as well. I mean, we, there's so many examples of like law firms, for example, that will go and buy a printer and load the cartridges up and install the driver and set it up on the network. And they've wasted one to two hours setting it up when that's billable time. They could have seen it one of their own clients, and, you know, they've lost, you know, between one and two hours, we would say four to $800 when they could have paid us the 160 to just do it for them. Absolutely. A lot of people don't realize that most of these things is actually costing them a whole lot more trying to do it themselves than yeah. getting somebody who's well equipped to work on that. Now, you did mention that you, um, you know, also work with lawyers and maybe accountants. And um, I don't know if you faced this uh, scenario with us in the digital marketing space. Some people would rather not work with us if we mention um, we're already working with their competition just simply because they're afraid, you know, there could be uh, their data could be stolen or their information could be transferred to them, how do you sort of help people, um, you know, um, be, have peace of mind, especially when they think that if they give you access to their passwords or any information pertaining to their business, um, their competitors will be able to see their data? Look, I guess um, the data, the data is all, we, at the moment we store it all on LastPass. And the reason I do that is because at any point, you know, we could, we could leave a laptop or lose a laptop or, you know, be compromised ourselves. So we've, we've moved everything into LastPass. In regards to um, uh, business owners, you know, intellectual property, again, if it's something that needs to be protected, then we, we've had some circumstances where we've had to sign like a non-disclosure agreement if there's a project they're working on. Um, but other than that, I guess there's just a general code with us that we don't discuss what, what, what each client's doing to each other. I mean, 
it's a, it's the same. It's the same with us, I guess, and it's the same with some of our business partners. But um, yeah, definitely, definitely don't want to be doing any of that. Um, but but certainly, just what's important to us is making sure that the way we store that information doesn't doesn't sort of easily come across our other clients. They're all in separate locations and separate folders. In you know, like it's it's, it's things like um, I guess. Uh, if someone's requesting a password, we don't like to send it via email, we text it to them instead or over, say it to them over the phone, things like that. But in terms of each other's, you know, two, two competing clients seeing each other's work, that's usually not going to happen. I mean, I guess it depends on what information you're storing about them, but the only thing we're really storing is just um, the logging credentials and settings for their equipment. But I can understand it in your circumstance where... If you're if you're working on a uh, a marketing strategy for a specific industry, then you know someone's going to want to have information about how that's working and whether it's profitable or you know whether they can adopt that themselves. But I guess for us, they're not gonna they're not they're not gonna. The only thing they really may ask is you know are other law firms using different software, okay. and and that's that's important to share that information. Like I mean, I I go into a law firm and I'll say, do you use Leap? Do you use Smokeball? Do you use Action Step? What's the software you use? And sometimes I'll say, we're using this, but it's too expensive. Or we're using this, but it's not compatible with the new office or whatever. And I'll say, but well, my other clients use this program and this program, you should look into it. That's about as far as what we share. And that's not really going to impact, um, you know, the, a business's growth or, or kill them over that information. Absolutely. And I, I value that, that answer because obviously every business is different, you know, and, you know, the way data is uh, stored is also in different silos, which is good. Now with IT comes software and hardware. You just did mention uh, software there. Um, are you um, capable to support both just in case some people might need upgrades with their yeah. computers or yeah. upgrades with their softwares and things of that nature? How far do you extend your support level? So the, the scope of work is we will, we will resolve issues that are hardware related and software related. Obviously, with some software subscriptions like Zero and um, Front Desk and Leap and whatever, whatever industry, every industry has their kind of, you know, two or three or four main um, software packages that they rely on. We will liaise with those particular companies if there's an error related to that software, um, if, we, if we've got that support. So definitely we'll work with them. If, the, if, the comp if it's a hardware related issue and those components are under warranty, then again, we will troubleshoot to a certain point. But usually that's why we like to build our own PCs because, for example, one of the main issues happens is someone goes and buys a brand name PC, like HP, Compaq, you know, Acer, whatever it is, the jumping office works. And then it's just out of warranty and the power supply goes and the computer doesn't turn on. I can't go to the nearest supplier and buy that power supply because it's made, it's, it's almost designed in a, you know, a small, nice, good looking way or whatever it is, like it's tight. Sometimes they're more small form factor. Um, and I can't go and buy that part. So I need to order it and get it shipped in. And that downtime can be expensive for a business that needs that continuity. So in that sense, I usually say, let's build you something custom because it's a custom case, custom power. I mean, not custom in the sense that the parts are not easy to find. It uses a generic type like standard size power supply, standard size motherboard, standard size everything. So if something goes down, we can actually go and just replace the part and send the part off ourselves and we wear the cost until it gets credited back to us. And then the customer's back up and running. Whereas with the brand names, I'm kind of stuck uh, where I need to send it off. We had a laptop that took three months to come back because of just logistics and dramas that they were excuses, who knows what it was and it has to go in line and wait to be assessed blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's really annoying for us. Um, Max, the same sort of thing. We can do things like upgrade RAM and upgrade hard drives. But again, uh, a lot of the new ones have got magnetized and glue, you know, there's glue involved and magnetized screens and things like that. So we do have a supplier we can take it to, but we'll usually tell the client, this is outside of our scope of repair. Um, and then obviously um, software, we do, we do software support, but we also help you with all your cloud-based stuff. So we kind of move in a little bit into sort of the web space as well. So we'll help people with troubleshooting issues with, um, you know, websites not coming up, domain name issues, emails not working, um, migrating to Office 365 or Google G Suite or setting up SharePoint and OneDrive and Dropbox and Google Drive, like all that sort of stuff. 
So that sort of space as well. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, your antivirus, making sure that's valid. So that's a lot of the stuff that we cover during the audit. But in, in terms of scope of work we do, that's, that's what we do. And I think you're right in that sort of, we get a lot of work from say, uh, web developers because their customers assume that because they're in the IT space and they're web developers, that they're gonna fix their email issues or they're gonna fix their printer not scanning or whatever it is. So we cover all that, all the stuff that everyone else doesn't basically. But um, yeah, that's pretty much in a nutshell. Absolutely. So since there's a large spectrum of the things that you do, do you also offer your clients training, um, you know, in order maybe troubleshoot or uh, working with the custom PCs that you make? Do you train them because they're not uh, what's on the market, um, you know, for them? Well, to the, soft, the software is the same. So it's still running Windows 10 or Windows 11. So right. that's all the same. But I mean, there are going to be times where like if we set up backup software for someone, we'll, we'll give them training on how to actually check the backups are working. Um, you know, we'll give them training on how to set up, you know, how to, how to add extra users to um, a SharePoint folder so that they can, you know, share with, share with clients or share with other staff. Um, but I guess the other important thing as well we do during um, audits, or people can utilise their hours for this as well, is going back and actually checking um, after a certain amount of time, things like, um, is the things that I was backing up initially the same things I want backed up now? Or are there additional things that I would need to add to the list? Maybe you've adopted new software, maybe you've added additional network folders or whatever it is. Um, the other one is, I guess, people don't never really review the shares, um, the permissions. So for example, say you set up Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever it is, you might have staff that have come or left or project managers or external people that you've worked with that you've shared specific folders with, but you've never gone through to do an audit and go, do I actually need to share these folders with these people anymore? So that's that's quite interesting to me. And it's one of the things that goes um, kind of, <laughs> people stop, don't really look at it too much. And when we review it, they realize they don't actually know who's got access to what, um, you know, who the, who the admin users are, who are the people that are allowed to, allowed to invite new people on, remove people, reset passwords, all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Now, obviously, if somebody um, feels like this is uh, something that I need to enjoy monthly access to, and they are probably within the catchment area, uh, you know, of Melbourne's uh, western suburbs where you operate, what's the first initial thing that they need to sort of do in order to uh, get started uh, with TechSeek? So they can jump on our website. Um, they can either give us a call or fill out the contact form. And then we'll usually reach out to them um, and ask them questions uh, such as, you know, what their location is, the industry type, number of staff, number of devices they'd like to support. And usually if we can get out to them on site, we'll go out on site and assess everything. And that's when we'll start looking at, you know, what are you currently paying for in terms of software subscriptions, um, in terms of support, are there other, you know, are there things like web hosting you're paying for, or, or online backup, whatever the case is, do that sort of analysis. Um, and then, and then if, if, like we said before, if need be, we can do an initial job for them or just literally sign them up and start um, managing all the, all the tasks we need to do. So it can be like in that example we spoke about where the customer didn't actually know who's got access to what because a staff member used to manage everything, manage all the IT and they left. Um, you know, it's literally going through everyone's computer and seeing what software is being installed. Do they have a valid antivirus license? Are they connected to um, shared uh, like online storage? What folders can they see? All that sort of stuff so that we build a picture for the client so that they get more control back about, okay, this is how everything's set up. This is the type of security. This is how we're backing things up. Um, all that sort of stuff. So we'll slowly start planning that and using their hours for that. So we allow their hours also to dip into like minus two because what happens is sometimes they might buy three, four hour, you know, months, but they've got a big project coming up. And so we allow the account to dip in um, to a minus before we, we charge for additional hours. And the idea is that if they can hold off then the 28th of the next month, the new billing month, they'll get their hours in again. So it's all about managing their cash flow at the end of the day. Absolutely. Now, Phil, obviously we might have a lawyer or an accountant or some person from the dental clinic whose uncle used to work for Telstra and 
can fix computers. What sort of advice can you give to people that just uh, trust backyard uh, computer tech? Uh, get a second opinion. I, I welcome any second opinions. I've, I've had a lot of those. And look, I, I've even gotten to a point where um, I've had some clients where I, I've helped them draft a letter to their IT company to just give them a bit more control over, you know, having them. Because I guess I don't, when I'm asking those questions about, you know, who's backing up and where are you backing up and where's your antivirus and all that sort of stuff, if they can't answer those questions, and they're still wanting to sort of remain with their current IT provider, that's fine. But I'd like to at least um, give them some questions to ask that tech um, or that tech company about, you know, can they answer these questions um, off the cusp? And, and, and if they can't and they see there's a bit of like, you know, hey, uh, we've got to organise a visit because it's been a long time sort of thing, then, you know, it's up to the customer to decide whether they continue that relationship or not. Absolutely. No. Phil, I can't thank you enough for your time on the show today. This has been very informative and it's quite, um, you know, um, humbling to know that there's services like that out there that people can actually use. Now, I can understand if you're watching the show right now, information technology is a complex and ever changing area and you can be overwhelmed, um, you know, especially if you're a business owner or if you're a manager to actually navigate this on your own. I'm going to pose this question to you. If you've got a toothache, are you going to reach out and try and take your tooth out by yourself or are you going to go to a dentist? So why are you uh, letting your computer problems, um, you know, bog you down when you can actually get, um, you know, the special specialist to help you out, especially Phil from TechSig. I appreciate your time today, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Fantastic.
Fantastic. Good stuff. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So obviously, um, if you can allow a week or so um, for my boys to uh, yeah, this clean this up, and then obviously, then you can have a copy of it. So I'm not, I'm not on on social media. I mean, I'm not, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on uh, LinkedIn. But it will be tagged from our business page. So then, then you can always get um, that copy. And yep. if you want to share it, you can share it, but I will be using this as a, if I'm recommending people to you, I can actually just put this in, in a video and then, uh, I mean, I can just put it in an email so that people can sort of make their own sort of uh, decision, especially if they're within that sort of area of yours. Cool. All right. Cool. Um, I'm happy with this. 